Hey everyone, welcome to CS Education Zoo episode three. Um, and you can see we've got a monotonically uh, increasing production quality with our splash screen. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Steve, who will introduce our guest of the week. All right, thank you, Will. Uh, this is episode four, by the way. We're, we're uh, oh, <laughs> we're, I had one job. We're on to a new hope now. Um, okay, so uh, so our guest today, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Rebecca Bates. She's professor of computer science and chair of integrated engineering at Minnesota State University Mankato, and she was a Fulbright scholar at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, Becky teaches computer science and engineering, uh, and her classes are often uh, project-oriented with very strong ties to broader social and ethical themes. Uh, and my personal favorite fact is that Becky teaches an AI and science fiction course. Uh, so welcome, Becky. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Cool. Uh, so I wanted to start by geeking out a little and just asking you to describe the sci-fi and AI course for, <laughs> for a little while, because otherwise it's going to be the elephant in the room. OK. So so yeah, I um, was thinking about what, what do I like to do, and what do I see other students liking to do, and why can't I make a class that looks like the classes my friends get to teach over in Arts and Humanities? Yeah, if they have a good book they like, they can just make a whole class on it. So um, we hardly ever do that with like programming textbooks. So I took a bunch of the books that I liked and and basically created a class around the books and the and the movies that I like. And my idea was, we want computer science students and professionals to really be able to connect to the creativity that comes with knowledge about society, knowledge about history, and the knowledge of the creative process, which really comes out in writing. So um, so the idea of this class is that we kind of look at some of the history of science fiction, especially as it, how it connects to robotics and artificial intelligence, and, and trace the pathways through time. And so much of these discussions, when we look at history, lets us also think about a lot of the ethical and societal issue, issues that come up as well. So in, our, in my university, it's a general education class that has, um, it of course fulfills literature requirements, but it also fulfills an ethical requirement that students have. And then because it's about reading and writing as a, as a good response to the reading, it's also a writing intensive class. So it's, it's a lot of fun. We have um, one movie a week that students watch and we read quite a few short stories and uh, quite a few novels. And the, the better students get all the way through all of the novels. So, so let me be a brief curmudgeon then. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a really, say, uh, technically oriented CS undergrad, and I'm like, why should I take this course? Because it's, it's just going to delay the time I could spend learning Ruby on Rails. Or right. Like well, it's actually not a required CS technical class. It fulfills the general education requ requirements for all of the majors at our university. So um, even, even the, the small engineering uh, requirements for general education, they can have this one count as well. So it's not going to detract from any of your technical courses, but it includes a lot of the technology in the course. So I talk a lot about some of the basic ideas of um, of how we think about intelligence from a computer science point of view, how we think about humans um, modeling human behavior, both thinking and actions in robotics, and then we end up talking a lot about search. So I connect, I connect the um, the ideas that we teach in the in data in like data mining and intelligent systems and AI classes. I pull that material in so that students can see the parallels. So notice what kind of what kind of AI is being implemented in this story. So I, people should take it because they have other university requirements to fulfill, and you may as well learn more technology while you're taking this class. So it's above and beyond. It's not hard to get them to want to take it. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. Cool. Uh, Will, you want to take one away? Uh, sure. Well, I have a, 
question, a follow-up question to sci-fi. Um, so there's a very popular sci-fi author, Neil Stevenson, who basically has been saying recently that sci-fi has become way too dystopian, uh -huh. and that it's basically failing to inspire people like sci-fi in the 50s was yeah. doing, inspiring the next generation of engineers and scientists. Do, do, you, uh, do you think that's true, and do you take that into account at all in terms of your selections for the course? Well, um, I always include I always include Asimov, so there is there is an idea of a future that's not dystopian, a little more realistic. Um, I I do I do like to include Neil Stevenson. I think every student should read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So um, you know, before they graduate, that that should be like a graduation requirement from. From my perspective, um, so so I think certainly in my choice, there's a blend of um, of what kinds of of fiction I include. I had one student last year write a paper on transformers, and I'm like, I don't, you know, I have no background in transformers. You need to, you know, it's not like writing a paper about Star Wars. You actually have to set up the universe for me, and she really struggled to get it small enough to to make it understandable. But there's there's a lot of fiction out there. Some of it some of it is dystopian and may or may not be inspiring, but but some of it is, and students find what's in, what inspires them. I try to have a broad enough range that something will inspire them. What is the most interesting or informative sci-fi book or novel that, that you tend to cover, and why is it so interesting? Um, well, I love Neal Stevenson's The Diamond Age. And I'm actually talking with a, a group of colleagues about having us read that as a, as a book um, for kind of a Basically, it's a monthly international discussion about engineering education research. I'm like, I, th I think we should read fiction this year and not something else to improve us. The fiction should improve us enough. Um, but this idea that um, we can think about how information moves, we can think about how machine learning happens, how that parallels with, um, with not just the machine learning but also human learning, and then what does adaptive technology really let us do. So maybe we can sh shoot bullets out of our forehead, but maybe we can also really implement something that can, can support society. Dutch, you had a question? Yeah, uh, I was wondering when computer scientists take your course, if you notice that they have a different take on these issues from the other students. You know, it's 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 not so much a different take. It, it seems like it's much more connected to what the students have already thought about in the past, and if they're ones that are likely to be making some of these connections or not. So sometimes, um, I actually taught this class as a graduate class when I was on sabbatical in Brazil, and I had a whole class of graduate students taking it. Um, so it was in English. It was supposed to actually help them improve their English. And I asked them to do, instead of, instead of doing just papers, I asked them to do projects, significant projects, where they had to either do something in AI and connect that to, to fiction, or do something related to fiction and connect that to the technology. Um, there's something about the draw that this topic has for students they tend to want to talk about what shows up in fiction. And the what I saw from the students in Brazil, and I don't think it's necessarily different from graduate students and, and CS undergraduates in the States, is that they wanted to talk about these issues. They wanted to talk about the impact of the technology that they'd be developing, and it wasn't happening anywhere else. So, so in their in their gen ed classes where they could maybe talk about societal issues, they weren't talking directly about what they were going to be creating or what they were going to be doing as a job. And in the classes where where maybe some ethical issues would come up or some possibility for reflection on these ideas, they were like, okay, no, what's the next thing for Ruby on Rails? What's the next? You know, tell it. We have to learn the next algorithm. And the professors were driving the technical learning and getting enough content and not actually helping the students connect to these ideas that the students really wanted to connect to. So I, I think it's really valuable there because it's a space for our students to talk about things they want to talk about 
and it's a way to help them. If we think about how we are, you know, we love talking about this stuff. It it spurs us. It inspires us. It gives us meaning when we know why we're doing something or for whom we're doing something. And our students want that as well. And this, the context of a book means we can talk about these ideas and that can really that can really help the students get through get through that thesis defense or get through that really hard programming problem they have extra they have um they have some external idea that they can develop strong internal connections to that will motivate them and and i think i think this is where the power of story can can really be harnessed fantastic all right, so can I uh, can I take the next? I get a little one passionate here? about this. <laughs> I can tell, <laughs> as well you should. Uh, all right, so can I take it away from that course now a little? Sure, sure. All right, I, I wanted to ask more generally about the the project based courses that, that you lead. Um, what do you think makes? Uh, well, first of all, but before before you get into my question, maybe you could mention a bit about what sort of project-based courses you do, but what I was going to ask you is what makes a project-based course, project-based learning, successful for students? Okay, so so when I teach when I teach traditional courses, I tend to put projects in them, and most of us do. It's like, you're a big project for this. What are you going to do? And, and we know that those projects are where so much of the student learning happens that really the synthesis of the information that they've had, you know, maybe they had to do something to solve some small programming assignment or they answered a question that helps them show that they remembered a, a fact, but it's in doing the project and constructing something that's bigger that requires information from multiple sources, maybe having to draw in a class that you took a year and a half ago, that's where really good learning happens. But in our traditional classes, most of what happens is that we're doing a project that we kind of thought of. Like we thought it's it's something they can do in about half a semester, knowing that I'm I'm only one of four or five classes that the student's taking. It can't take up all of their time. It has to have these kinds of outcomes with it. So instead of a really meaty, ill-structured problem, that are real world problems, we kind of have to constrain it enough to, to really meet the goals of that one class. So, so this is a really typical thing. It's better than just doing um, multiple choice exams and, and small problem sets because you get to develop more of your thinking. So what we've done in our project-based learning programs is say we need bigger problems to work on. So instead of having perhaps a like parallel four or five classes going with projects in each of them, each semester I'll have one big project that goes across the whole semester. And then the technical learning that students need to do hangs off of that one project. So it's a pretty significant project. Students work in teams. They're asked to pull together a lot of different kinds of engineering knowledge or possibly software engineering knowledge and they end up having to use multiple aspects of their learning just to get it solved and if they're not working on a particular aspect of it they still have to communicate with the student that's working on that so so we see that um, it's a large project that they can't do on their own it's because it's the only project they're working on that semester they can devote a lot of energy to it a lot of time and then because it's it's large and ill structured we at the beginning of the semester we don't know what they're going to learn I can tell them I can talk to them about how they're going to learn I can talk to them about the general area they're going to learn but we actually have two registration points for our technical competencies we know they're going to do the stuff that goes along with doing a project the writing the communication the teamwork the professionalism but for the technical topics we register for half so eight credits a semester they do this Half of those credits are registered at the beginning because we can tell just to scope out the project, you're going to need to learn these things. And then in the middle of the semester, they say, okay, what are you going to have to learn to complete this project? We have a better idea halfway through the semester. And so they register then for what they need to learn for the second half of the semester. So it's a large project. They 
come up at the end, they really have completed something significant, and it's connected to real problems. So we get we pull our projects from industry. So what could an engineer working full time for two weeks do? You know, somebody that has a background knows how to do it, but doesn't have two weeks to do. Give that project to our undergrads, and they'll get something done. It might not be what you thought. It might not work. These are undergrads. <laughs> um, but it could be something that's really, really interesting or really outstanding or really gives you an idea of what, what areas you should ignore in the future and what areas you should try. I like to tell companies, go, go to your list of things you want to do and give us the one that's always fourth on the list. It never bubbles all the way up to number one or two but it's still always on your list, you're always aware of it, it'll be really good to get done when somebody has time. That's a good, that's often a really good project for undergrads. So knowing it has meaning, knowing that, you know, maybe it won't happen immediately, but maybe in the next year or so, the results of your project will really make a difference to some, to some product, to some process. This is something that our students really, really appreciate. That is really neat. So, um, so they're they're taking a bunch of courses at the same time. Is is this actually integrated into those other courses, or is it serendipity? It's specific. It's it's um, <laughs> the curriculum committee process was hellish <laughs> because these these don't look like anything else. Um, the idea is you have this one project, and in doing this project, you're going to meet the ABA engineering outcomes. So we don't say what, what specific technical idea you are going to have. We say you are you know, one quarter of the way closer to meeting a graduate's expectations of being able to solve engineering, process, process, engineering problems using a mathematic and scientific foundation, that you'll be able to understand the context of your problem solving in, in a societal, ethical, political, economic context. You'll be able to communicate your information. You'll be able to work on interdisciplinary teams. So we're, we're moving towards that. So the classes we have people take reflect the doing the design process and developing these professional skills. And then they have to collect evidence that they've learned particular technical things. So, so as much as possible, everything hangs off that project. Fantastic. Uh, Will, do you have a question you want to take next? Or? Sure. Uh, so so run, you know, running non-trivial projects is, I think, a great learning experience. And I've, I've done that a number of times. A couple of tricky things come up that are, to some extent, logistical. Uh, one is dealing with assessment when people are working on different different projects of different, somewhat mm -hmm. different complexity, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, another issue I've seen is uh, dealing with the, that level of uncertainty or non-structure uh, for students for the first time sometimes freaks them out. Yeah. And then the other thing is, you know, what happens if you have a, a, a team member who isn't pulling their weight or if someone leaves during the middle of the semester mm -hmm. or something like that. So I'm curious how, you know, what your experiences are with those issues and how, you know, you try to deal with those. Yeah, so, so those are three key problems or or um, as one of one of our faculty says, opportunities. Um, there, <laughs> these come up. <laughs> so, so assessment is interesting. Um, every every team has a faculty mentor, who um, and we we have a lot of discussions about who who actually does the evaluation because sometimes the team mentor is so close to it that they think you know they know how much everybody's worked and so they think if everything's wonderful but if somebody else looks at it they're like no this 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 whole entire document's a C it's, there's no way it can be an A even if they like they had to climb Mount Everest just to deliver you that document so um, you know the grades for climbing Mount Everest go in a different bin so so this is this is um, this is something we talk about a lot, that what what should it look like? Should it be teams of people evaluating our written documents? What about the technical presentations? We have rubrics for all of this, and um, which which does help 
to make sure that that there's consistency but then you know the so then the trade-off is does everybody have to grade twice as much now so that we have two sets of eyes on everything but but that's probably a, a good way to deal with with that kind of assessment across project work for the technical competencies which are about half of the credits for students a little more than half students are graded based on how they do how they do work how they um, every student does a deep learning activity in the technical topics and they do oral exams and the oral exams are tend to be um, you know, the, the professor teaching digital logic will ask, typically ask very similar types of questions. And so then there's consistency across that, the same as one professor grading their class. Um, so, so assessment is something we keep working on. Um, it's, it's also something that, that does take work and lots of conversation to deal with. The other question is about structure. This is, this is, um, this is a really hard program for students that want to be told exactly what to do. It's really difficult because um, I can't tell them exactly what to learn. I need to tell them, I need them to explore until they figure out what's likely to help and what's not. And so we provide scaffolding for it, but I can't tell somebody exactly what class they're going to take at the, in the second half of their last semester senior year. I, I don't know. Um, so so in, in a lot of places you can have a plan from freshman to senior year to graduate and you can follow it. But that, that doesn't work here because we need our students and our program to be adaptable. What's going to fit the problems that are that are that need to be solved? And you know, guess which one sounds more like real life? So we try to scaffold it and structure it so that it works that way early on so that by the time people are stepping into a, a business world, they're, they're able to be responsive and flexible and adaptable to whatever they need to learn. So, so students do structure with that. And, or students struggle with the structure issue. Some are amazing. They're like, oh, I can learn whatever I want. I'm going to learn 10 million things. And they do, and we send them to grad school, and they keep going. Um, but, but, you know, so we, we have to be aware of it and balance that. And then team problems. Yes. <laughs> People get, um, you can't get away from team problems. We have had students have to leave in the in the middle of a semester just because, uh, and and by students, two, <laughs> two out of out in the last four years. So this is not a high number, but but it's happened where sometimes students just can't get along, and then the question is, is this kind of team environment, this project based environment, the right place for you? Maybe you should be in a traditional program, and maybe it should be. Um, Maybe it should be um, something where you know that the kind of job you're going to get into will be as far removed from teamwork as possible. There are not that many jobs like that anymore. Uh, oh yeah, so, so one, one more related logistical question. If, if they're doing a project over the course of a semester, some students have been known to try to wait until the last minute to do things and so forth. So, so how how do you try to make sure that things are on track? And you know, do, do, are you having periodic uh, checkpoints where you're checking to see, hey, you're really on track? And if not, you know, do you have strategies to try to get them back on on track? Yeah. So so um, every week there is a design review meeting with their faculty mentor, or sometimes we have industry mentors that come in and work with our students, you know, twice a week to to just mentor the project. Um, the there's different checkpoints across the semester. So we start off with a scoping process. What is so you've learned about the problem. What is it that you think you're actually going to do? and define it. And that scoping process includes a presentation. So basically as part of the communication, you stand up and say, we heard people say this and this is our plan. And it's like a, you know, a miniature defense. Well, what about this? Have you thought about that? That this is something where, where holes can be poked into their plan. 
And then the next step is creating options. What are the options you're going to? So within the scope, what are three possible solution processes you could go on and which one are you going to do? And then, especially after that, there's the weekly check-in points, and then there's a final design review, and that gets presented to the um, to the to the program community, and it gets presented to um, and then it gets presented to the industry clients. So there's a little bit of a time to revise it, and then um, and then present it to you know wear your suits and ties and and present it to the clients, and along with that final design. Uh, presentation there's also a, a large written document so because that large written document is large and written there's also checkpoints for developing that over the semester so if we didn't have the checkpoints yes everybody tries to do a semester-long project in two weeks we try but <laughs> the still stuff gets pushed to the end <laughs> uh, Steve did you want to ask uh, Rob's question <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so we, we've got uh, Rob Simmons in the peanut gallery. He was a previous uh, guest on the zoo. Uh, he's the raccoon for those in the audience who, who can't remember which one he was, if that helps. <laughs> um, uh, Rob's in a cafe right now, so he's, he's not sure he can ask this uh, live. Um, he's curious to hear more about this uh, hellish curriculum process, uh, curriculum approval process you described. What, what were the arguments against mm -hmm. approval, and how did you answer those arguments? Well, so what happened was how I first knew we were even doing this program on our campus was because I was on the curriculum committee. And uh, these people came in and started presenting the curriculum, and I was like, this is so cool. And what was happening was they were talking this way about, here's what our curriculum does. Here's how we have students learn. Here are our end goals. And the curriculum committee was saying, but what are you teaching? So this kind of conversation thing was happening, that everybody was trying to get a curriculum approved and the conversation wasn't going in the same direction. So what the curriculum committee wanted to hear was exactly what will the students be learning. And what we were saying, or and because I, I ended up getting get joining the team in a little while, what we ended up saying, what we started out saying was this is how the students will learn. So then what really joined the conversation was the idea of outcomes and the idea of programmatic outcomes and how those get divided up across courses. So if you have, this is an upper division program, so we deal with the last two years. If you have four semesters, where do we expect people to be in their ability to meet these issues? across these four semesters. So, so once we started talking about that, as well as some of the um, specific, where possible, some of the specific technical content ideas, um, we, we, did, um, we were able to have a much better conversation. But where things continue, and this is still continuing with how do we transcript this? How do we, um, how do we maintain flexibility? So, with our advanced electives, I've had students take, do really interesting coursework on fire safety in iron mines, and I've had other students do um, things that look at how do, how do tendons work in, in human hands. So if I, to get a name for a class that covers all of these possibilities is impossible. And, um, you know, Having, having the flexibility, I asked the registrar, like, can't we just give you a list at the end of every semester of what the students learned and you just tack it on? Like, they took eight credits and it was, these were the titles of what they learned. They, they didn't like that idea. Um, so what we've done is given, given the electives bins. So this is in transportation, this is in systems engineering, this is in biomedical engineering. And so then some of the transcript information starts to better reflect what the students actually did. But it's, um, yeah, it's <laughs> getting, getting people to agree that the how is important, but us to also see that we needed to give enough information about the what so that people really feel comfortable, that it's not just this like, oh, woo-woo, we sat around and, and sang campfire songs and get engineering degrees at the end. No, that's, there are, there, it's, it's technically rigorous, 
but it's also it's also something where um, along with the technical competencies we're really in integrating in this idea of what kinds of pro professional skills do you develop and how do you make the transition from being a student in engineering or computer science and being a professional in that area and our, our idea is you start the practice early and you repeat it and you get feedback and there's an improvement process for the students that looks like the improvement process for the program. We revisit it. And this is this is where reflection can come in as well. So so the curriculum process, to get back to that, it's it's an ongoing one because we want a program like this doesn't necessarily fit into the exact same boxes we figured out how to make so that people pay for the right amount of their education. And credits are really like Credits are a, a, a mapping from hours spent to dollars paid, and it's it's a lot harder to do that for a project. You know, students should spend 40 hours per credit. Okay, but if you're doing a project you really care about and you really want to get it done, you might spend a lot more hours. But I think we all know that experience of wanting to get it done and get it done well, and so we spend all weekend in the lab. It's not a bad thing for students to do. <laughs> Maybe not every weekend. <laughs> wow, so that, that uh, that's a great answer, and that curriculum process truly does sound hellish. <laughs> um, uh, okay, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna change tracks for a moment and okay. ask you something I've been asking everyone, but I think it's gonna be a real slow pitch for you, Becky. So I've been asking everyone, what's something you think every Read, learn, do, or play with. I you you cut out, so I couldn't hear the whole question, and I really hesitate oh, to make it up. Sorry. Uh, what's something every computer scientist should read, or learn, or do, or play with? Oh, didn't I already say Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? <laughs> that'll do. That'll do. If that's your answer. Um. Well, it's it feels incomplete. Because you should, at a minimum, know what 42 is, and um, and I said that at a SIGSI uh, at a SIGSI session we did on science fiction, and there were people that didn't know what 42 was, and I I felt really bad because the whole point was how do I help students by teaching them about this? How do I help them feel like they can come into this community that tends to enjoy some really similar things. And then I was telling other people in the community that maybe they didn't belong because they didn't know um, uh, they, they didn't know what 42 was. And I see the question here of is it sufficient to just watch the movie and the answer according to my students is no. <laughs> I had I had some they don't you don't learn about gin and tonics if you if you watch the movie. So um, I, I actually assigned it to an intro class to read the book and then one day I was very very sick and I couldn't teach and I said alright I'm gonna let you watch the movie and um, and one student had said oh good I was waiting to watch the movie I didn't want to read the book and all of the other students jumped I, I just looked like shocked and all of the other students jumped on him no, you have to read the book. It's such a wonderful book. The movie doesn't cut it. You need to. You really need to get the words. So it's that's definitely one where you want the experience of going through the words. It's possible you could listen to the radio play and <laughs> have that instead, but not just the movie. I, I think I actually did hear the radio play first before I read the book. My <laughs> my dad played it to me when I was little. Wow. <laughs> Um, okay, so I've got one other that I ask uh, all the guests then. Um, how about this one? Can you tell us about a teacher you've had that you really admired and, and what you admired about them? Your favorite teacher, if you like. Well, the first one that came to mind was the one that had to deal with me, you know, this very serious and probably not very good student in my first programming class and just trying to make sense of everything that was drawn on the board and trying to connect that to the IBM 3090 that I had to program on. And um, and he kept using these non like n words that I didn't understand the meaning 
and it turns out it's nonsense but but I didn't know that then and so I raised my hand in this class I was you know one of four women in the class and raised my hand and asked Professor Roscoe Giles what does foo mean and he 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 explained it um, not in quite as much depth depth for me to really get the whole FUBAR acronym but um, but I did understand then that you could name a variable anything and it would work and that became something that I took into all of my programming classes that um, you know this is we call things foo and we call things bar because we can call them anything and this is where it comes from and if you have any questions that feel like maybe they're stupid but could help you understand then here's the story of me and you guys can ask me questions too so 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 that experience of having having a professor really patiently answer a question without making me feel like I was stupid is something that I definitely carried forward also it helped me know that sometimes things just don't make sense in programming yes that's important will you wanna you wanna take the next one sure uh, are there any dream courses or sort of I don't know off the uh, beaten path type courses that you would love to teach that you know just haven't gotten around to it or maybe they're a little too yeah. out there I'm like trying to imagine something I'd rather teach than AI and sci-fi um, because that that one really is is a dream that that um, I get so much positive feedback from students that we can talk about we we can read books we can in this class that's technical we can talk about war and we can talk about how our society treats soldiers and how our society treats civilians in conflict and we can talk about what about people that don't have access to education and these are these are all things that there are potential technical solutions to many of these things but the struggles that come with them are things we can talk about in class and so I don't because I think that it's it's so important that we think about how our technology can connect to and improve our society to have to have a space for that in a class is is that's where my dream class is so I should be able to think of other ways to do it I mean I pull it out in any kind of design course that I'm doing anytime I'm doing multidisciplinary seminars I get to I get to pull that out for students so so I think dream classes are ones that would continue to let me do this as much as possible but it's hard to beat doing it with you know Star Wars as the opening movie for the semester uh have, have you gotten any direct feedback from former students about, you know, I was in industry and I was asked to work on this project and based on some of the things we talked about, you know, I, I felt uncomfortable and I talked to my boss about it. You know, anything like that from talking about these ethical dilemmas or issues? Yeah, not really. What I did get from one student, though, which was, which was, um, from the impact on on a personal level of, of how do you where do you draw pleasure from in your life I have a student who's a grad student at Rutgers now and when the hurricane Sandy went through they lost power for about a week and what he did was sit in his apartment and reread all of the books from my class he went back through and and just he was like I just had this time I couldn't run any experiments I couldn't check anything I just went through and and reread all of these books and he and he enjoyed it enough to let me know that this was what he had done with that kind of free free space free time that he had and when somebody is able to take that and and really derive pleasure from it that that's great those stories will stay with him if uh if someone else wanted to offer a course like this, you know, what, what suggestions would you have for them? Or what, what things have you learned from teaching this course? What things did you learn not to do? What things would you do you think work particularly well? Uh, 
the first time, the first couple of times I taught it, I thought it was really important for all of these students, especially ones from the liberal arts, to to have experience with like kind of coding something, and and so I worked with the Orange Data Mining Toolkit to let people kind of have experiences of training a model and coming up, you know, separating training data and test data and coming up with a response and checking predictions, and I think that kind of experience is less important that they're already seeing the evidence, you know, half of them have iPhones and they can see when the speech recognition technology breaks. So so they have experiences of training and failure and, and correct solutions. So I'm not, um, I'm not as worried about really trying to push technical experiences on students. I do still push the idea of understanding basics of the technology, the idea of of uninformed search versus informed search, but I think it's more important to to connect with with good stories and give and give students time to talk, and also give students time to do peer feedback uh, in for the writing pro part of the class. Have you gotten any science fiction authors involved in the the course, or would you like them to to get involved? Do you think that would add something? That would be amazing. Um, that's a really good idea. In Mankato, Minnesota, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about um, about pulling people in, but um, but so wow, the world of Google Hangouts and Skype, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I should probably pay more attention to the sure. technology that's available. Um, all in your office right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, classes don't start for a few more weeks. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder who I could get to to connect. Um, I think it's, um, I think that would be a great idea. I think even even thinking about, because um, one one of my um, stealth learning outcomes is is to think about a creative process because we. We use creativity anytime we solve a problem, anytime we work with, um, in, anytime we do a really good job building like beautiful, efficient software solutions. We're using our creativity. So how do we nurture that? How do we develop that? There's got to be parallels with the creativity that is is used for for arts for writing novels. And that side is where people have really spent a lot of time thinking about how do you nurture this? How do you support this? How do you give space for the creativity to come up? And so I think when we can learn from the arts and humanities about what helps you be creative and pull that into our own experiences, that's really valuable. So, so if I had an author, <laughs> I would ask them to talk about where do they, how do they nurture that in themselves, and then how could my students nurture that, maybe in my class for the writings they have to do, but maybe for their other programming classes, for their, you know, for their algorithms class. How do you imagine? How do you play with ideas that will let you be the one that comes up with the next best algorithm? For the writings that your students do, are, are these all analysis of the written works that they've, they've read, or do they write anything uh, new? Do they write any science fiction stories of their own? Um, I, so when I did it as um, more of a project course with the, with the um, Brazilians, I let, them, I let them choose to create fiction as one of their options, but then they had to write, like they still had to write a project report saying how did the fiction connect to the technology we discussed. I haven't really done that in the undergraduate classes. I do weekly reflection assignments based on the, um, based on the readings or the movie viewings that they've done, and then I do a couple of essays that then get revised, and then the final exam is basically writing. Um, I haven't really had them do their own fiction. I had an interesting, difficult experience as a grad student where I took a class that had four papers, but one of them could be a fiction paper. It's really hard, if you're not a fiction writer, <laughs> to write something good and to have it actually be a story and not just character development. Um, it's, it's, you know, if students put off papers until the last minute, Putting off fiction writing to the last minute is not 
a pretty thing. So I, I'd almost rather read the last minute nonfiction than the last minute fiction. So so I haven't I haven't made that be an option, but it but it could be an interesting extra credit for everybody kind of thing, like have that be available to everybody and then have it be graded by the class or something. Um, because that that could be, because that could come out almost like, um, like fan fiction and and like blogging communities of re related to the things that we re read. There could be some really fun ways to do that. I haven't, but but now I have some ideas. Get, bring authors in and let the students write fiction. Uh, Steve, did you want to ask the question for Rob? Uh, sure, I'll take that on. It's kind of the same question you just asked, except about the project course instead. What What are some things uh, Rob wants to know that that go, have gone ex unexpectedly well, and what are some things that have gone unexpectedly poorly? Aside from from the things that that we already talked about earlier about structure and assessment. Mm -hmm. So um, we had a team that um, there is a a company that needed to have a solution. To um, to a problem, they had these pools pools that were where it, it was a mining company, and there were pools, and there was silt in the bottom of these pools. That as they dumped wastewater in and let it filter out, they it kept getting more and more filled with silt, and it was on top of a big building. So if you imagine something where you thought it would be water in it, but now it's just getting more and more filled up with dirt. It's it's not. You know, first it's going to get too heavy for the building, and then second, it's not going to hold the water capacity it needs to to hold. And so they had gone to their in-house engineers for for some ideas of what to do. And the in-house engineers said, "Yeah, you're going to have to shut down the whole mine and clean everything out." And they're like, "Ooh, we don't want to shut down the mine." So they went to some engineering consultants. "Ooh, we don't want to shut down the mine." So they came to our students who were like, okay, they really don't want to shut down the mine. And they, I talked about the options document later or earlier. They came up with all of these possible options. They analyzed everything. And I saw that group of students who had done some, just some amazing calculations, some amazing design and analysis work. And they're all dressed up and they looked miserable because they're about to go and do their final design presentation to the company and tell them, they're going to have to shut down the mine. So they they were given this task of really like try to try to come up with something different. Just think out of the box. Use your brand new engineer, not constrained by preconceived notions, ideas, and come up with something different. And they came up with all of these ideas and analyzed them all and came back to what all of the other teams of engineers had said. And so it was kind of a last ditch effort to to get the answer they wanted to hear, but um, but. What went well for our students was that they came up with some great ideas, they analyzed them, they came to a decision that's actually backed by other engineers making decisions, and then they presented it in such a way that the company still felt like it had been a success. So that communication part was really kind of the unexpectedly well, because everybody going in knew, oh, we have to tell them something we know they don't want to hear. And when I saw the students later in the day, they 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 knew they'd done it well, and so that that was definitely a success. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, uh, it's a a failure that ended up being a success in in mm -hmm. some sense. Uh, but but it also seems like some of the advice you gave earlier is is going to help get around that sort of thing. Like when you say to a company, "I want I want that fourth most right. important idea," it's not yeah. something that they're already actively working on it's something that's that they'd like done but it's not happening right but. well this is one too where they were they were just so reluctant to shut down because <laughs> you lose a lot of money when you shut down and you can't just like it's not like flip a switch and you're off for 15 minutes and turn it back on it's like a long shutdown process and a long startup process so so it's a really big deal but even so even though this had been a duplication of results that that that's something that's really good experience for for the engineering students to have. 
Great. Uh, let's see. I think there was uh, one more question I had my notes for you. Uh, Will, do you think we have time for, for one more before shout outs and that sort of thing? Yeah, I think so. All right. Uh, so I had, can you tell me something you're a student of now and what you learned from that experience as a teacher? <laughs> So, so what I like to do is take dance classes, and um, and you'd think I've been doing them long enough, so I should be good at it. But I'm not actually that good at it. Um, my sister once saw me ice skating and said, "Oh, sweetie, you're like a really graceful duck," and <laughs> and I kept skating. Um, so, so there's there's something about the motion and the ability to do something, and um, and so I like to tap dance, and I like to I like to do jazz dance, but the learning process for me is so different. So I really like taking these classes when I, especially when I'm teaching intro classes, to remind myself how uncomfortable my students are, that the discomfort of like being in a class where you have to learn something as structured as an algorithm, and I often teach to non-majors for whom the, not only is this unfamiliar, it's not the way they even want their brains to think. They're still not sure why they have to take this class. And so, so to connect with them, to work on learning something that is hard for me to learn is, is a really good reminder of that kind of struggle and that kind of process. So for me to learn a dance step, like even eight counts of a dance step, I can give me eight numbers, I'll remember it, I'll remember it for a long time, but give me eight steps I have to do and remember what to do with my arm at the same time. I actually, some people, and I've read about these people and I think it's amazing, they can watch a person do something and then they copy it. Like, oh hey, do a single axle. Here's my single axle. Great. Okay, I have to translate the movements and the timing into an algorithm. So I actually give myself a list of words of what to do. And when everybody else is like, oh, I'm just moving my body like this, I am going one, two, three. I'm going through the steps in my head and following this written algorithm. I even made like I even created like a, a note system for tap dance so that I could read it like I read music so that I knew exactly what to do because I can't, I can't remember it. It doesn't store in my physical body. It's, it's really hard for me to learn this. But when I'm doing it, I remember, oh yeah, here's the student. I'm like, it's just an if, just, it, just curly brackets. Just put the curly brackets, that's all, just one, two. Um, it's, it's a different kind of learning. And I, I, I think learning something new really helps me be a lot more compassionate as a teacher. So I seek it out. <laughs> That's great. I, I, uh, I take martial arts now and I have that same feeling about like you watch you watch somebody do something and you're like ah, I don't know what just happened and then uh, <laughs> we also have to memorize the names of you know the various numbered kicks and that sort of thing and that's yeah. That's easy. There's there's these twenty year olds that are taking the class with me, and they're like, "Oh, we have to remember all eight kicks." And I'm like, "How about actually doing them?" <laughs> like, I can write the names. I can write them backwards. <laughs> Just don't make me do that kick. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right. So, Will, you want to call for the shout out? Shout out time. Uh, yeah. So, any shout outs? Anyone you like to thank, or any? Or anything you'd like to point us to in terms of resources or uh, anything like that? Okay, so let's see. So I wrote a paper in the Vancouver ASEE that talks about the AI and sci-fi class. So that's, um, and I think the title starts with AI and sci-fi. So, so that would be, I think that was 2011. Okay, we'll put a we'll put a link to that on the site. Yeah, so so that's um that that's like kind of lists the syllabus and the readings. So that that would be a good thing to check up on if people wanted to do that. I should formally thank the Iron Range Engineering and Twin Cities Engineering programs and all the students involved because I have sure learned a lot from them. And um, yeah, maybe maybe a shout out to the curriculum committees of my college for giving me some really useful stories. Great. 
Uh, let's see. So uh, I think that's it. You got anything more on your end, uh, Steve? Just thank you very much for joining us, Becky. That was great. Uh, it's always fun to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, thank, uh, thanks so much. This is very interesting. Will, are we ready to announce our next guest? or? Uh, I, well, I'm ready to announce that uh, David Nolan has agreed to uh, appear on the show. And um, still trying to line up the exact date. I think uh, he had some some schedule issues, but uh, hopefully we'll, he'll be on soon. And uh, he's very interesting because uh, he's a programmer who came from like an arts background, uh, filmmaking, um, and he's become a very famous closure programmer and a good friend of mine. So. Um, be interesting to see how you know, we, we've been talking to people mostly from academia. It'd be interesting to see someone who's learned kind of uh, more on their own or has a very different background. So I think that'd be a lot of fun. And and, and I should point out, uh, I'm very glad that we have Rob here, for example. So so previous guests are always invited to be part of the peanut gallery and ask their questions. So. <laughs> And, and that goes for you too, Becky. Welcome to the yeah. bestiary. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to be part. <laughs> All right. Well, I will uh, stop the broadcast, and then uh, we can hang out more if people want to talk. Uh, otherwise, uh, catch you next time. Thanks again.